Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our ongoing study in Resurrected to Eternal Life by Jürgen Moltmann, a personal essay from Professor Moltmann. We're going to continue by taking a look at pages 15 to 27, and uh, let's pick up with block one, the passion in light of the resurrection, Christ's descent into hell. Revelation 1, 17 and 18, I am the living one, and I have the keys to death and Hades. Jesus was both damned and chosen. His descent into hell came after death and before the resurrection, says the Apostles' Creed. Christ suffered the despair of the damned. But he himself is the key to hell, having become a curse for us. Galatians 3.13 I love Galatians. That's a, I've said this before, but it's the first book of the New Testament uh, in chronological order. And it is the uh, gospel according to Paul. I love the book of Galatians. Christ became a curse for us. He obliterates the kingdom of death with his resurrection. He destroys the gate of hell with his cross. Matthew 27, 46. Christ was forsaken as one eternally damned. In this, our uncertain election is made sure. Our election is made a certainty in the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. En Christos. We are in Christ eternally. Now the passion of Christ in light of his resurrection, 1-3. Romans 4.25. Our Lord was handed over to death for our trespasses for our justification. Sin is distancing oneself from God an infringement upon our relationship to God. It is a sickness unto death, where we find ourselves outside God. Christ, however, draws nearer to us through his passion, making us children of God, creating divine solidarity. Romans 8, 31 and 32, He gave up his Son for all of us and will also give us everything else. God draws nearer to the God forsaken through his son. Paradidomi, to give up, to sacrifice. The father sacrificed his son. He gave up his son for our sanctification, for the ability to enter into unity with the triune Godhead. And it is through the, uh, it is through the God forsakenness that Christ suffered that we know that those in Christ shall never be God forsaken because Christ suffered God forsakenness for his elect, for the elect. We are in Christos, we are delivered from God forsakenness. But that reminds us that everything concerning our eternal life rests on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Let's go to block two. And we, we know we all believe that, we all know that's the truth. Everything concerning our eternal future rests on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at block two here. Kingdom of God equals salvation of earth and the community of the earth. The beginning of God's new world. Both images belong together. We live in the life coming, life of coming world. The life of coming world of God as life from everlasting life. It is life from everlasting life. It equals the reign of Christ. Christ's resurrection appointed him as Kyrios, Lord. In the Greek, Kyrios is Lord. Over all of existence, Philippians 2.11, and over every tongue. We affirm Jesus Christ as Kyrios, as Lord. In many of the uh, cities like uh, Ephesus, they had uh, signs up uh, declaring, like, well, in Ephesus, declaring Domitian, Curias, Lord, over all 
existence. The emperor was considered the Kyrios Lord, so to call Jesus Christ Kyrios was a threat to Roman government and considered to be punishable by death. But Christ is Kyrios, Lord. Now, block two, note three, living within Christ's dominion. Kyrios, Lord, implies freedom and liberation. Take a look at Exodus 22. I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. The Lord is the God of Exodus. And also, the docks of glory. I like uh, what uh, Moltmann says here. The docks of glory of God's compassionate incarnate presence. And I've always, in my studies, I've come to the same conclusion. The doxa glory of God. Now, doxa is the Greek for Shekinah in the Hebrew, but the doxa glory of God is always incarnate glory that dwells among us. The veil to the Holy of Holies was torn asunder, and God dwells with us as a living tabernacle, and therefore we experience the presence of the doxa glory of God's compassionate incarnate presence. And we look at Exodus 3, 7, and 8, and I love this. I love this verse that Moltmann pulls out. Exodus 3, 7, and 8. I know their suffering. I have come down to deliver them. That was an act of becoming incarnate within the sufferings of God's elect. I have come down to deliver them. Remember, we discussed in previous lessons many times the eternal generation of the Son, which is the foundation for our election. Now, Romans 14, 7 and 9. <clears throat> and that is a, a beautiful passage. We do not live to ourselves or die to ourselves. We live to the Lord. We die to the Lord. We are the Lord's. Christ is Lord of both the dead and the living. And as believers, we affirm Romans 14, 7 through 9. I live and Christos in Christ, and I will die and Christos. I will die in Christ. Whether I live or I die, I am in Christ. I affirm that with all sincere conviction. Romans 14, 7 through 9 is imprinted on my heart. And I'm sure it is in any believer's heart, whether we live or we die, we live or die in Christos. We live or we die in Christos. Paul used the sign in Christos over 600 times in his letters. We've discussed it before, but that is his number one sign for the kingdom and Christos. Over 600 times he used that sign in his letters. And uh, Romans 14, 7 through 9 makes that emphatically clear. Now, block three, we get uh, a very personal confession from Jürgen Moltmann. Because he gives us his interpretation of the fact that we are resurrected at the hour of death. Very personal message here in block three. The hour of our death. The entirety of our life is resurrected at the hour of death to eternal life. Thou shalt rise again at the last day. But the last day equals when time ends and eternity begins. It's called the day of days. At the hour of death, the soul is resurrected and awakened. I believe that with Moltmann. At the hour of death, the soul is resurrected and awakened. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, just before his execution in the concentration camp on April 9, 1945, said, This is the end, of, end for me. It is the beginning of life. The beginning of life, 1 Corinthians 15, 35. How are the dead raised? With what kind of body? And then 15, 36. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. It dies to take on a new form. What is raised is imperishable. Then 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44. 
Now the seeds for the kingdom of God are a life. Boltman says that seed is a life of sowing and sacrifice. We live according to agape, self-giving love, sacrificial love. That's what agape is. Agape is sowing and sacrifice. That is agape. We, we live a life of sowing and sacrifice that becomes the seeds for kingdom of God. Our entire life is resurrected and transfigured into a new gestalt, a new, that's the German for a new form. 1 Corinthians 15, 38. With a body as God has chosen, but it will be a body of doxa splendor. Remember, we are changed from glory to glory. The doxa glory of Christ uh, means that we will receive a body of a real, a transfiguration of doxa splendor. The natural cycle of life is resolved as birth and life. 1 Corinthians 15, 54, death is swallowed up in victory. Moltmann says, go take a look at Isaiah 25, 8. It will affirm the same thing. This is <clears throat> incredibly personable, but uh, these are his, this is Professor Moltmann's convictions. These are the convictions of my friend. And I, you know, obviously I shared these convictions. I've studied his theology all of my life. We've uh, exchanged letters and gifts and discussions, you know, all of my adult life ever since, uh, well, actually, I was introduced to Jürgen Moltmann by my friend, Professor Braidfoot at Dallas Baptist University. He was my philosophy professor, and uh, he presented me uh, at my graduation. He gave me Jürgen Moltmann's Theology of Hope. He says, Barry, this just seems to me like a good fit for you. That's what he said. What a great, what a great, great friend. And uh, it was a beautiful fit for me because I was really uh, uh, transformed and inspired by the theology of hope. But it didn't end there. Because later in life, when I uh, was doing a social work in Lansing, Michigan, I was in a shelter home, and I was supervising a shelter home for neglected and abused children. And while I was in that environment, I read Moltmann's second book, The Crucified God. And it spoke to the situation I was working within, with these neglected and abused children. And The Crucified God is the, and I'm not the only person to say this, but it is his best Manuscript. It is uh, by far, I had a, a member of my church ask me, all right, Barry, if I only pick one book of Jürgen Moltmann's to read, what should it be? And I said, The Crucified God, not The Theology of Hope. You should read that one second. You should read, if you're only, only going to study one, study The Crucified God. It is basically... Uh, encapsulated in block one here. It's all about uh, block one, note two, Christ became a curse for us. He suffered God forsakenness. He suffered God forsakenness. And because he suffered God forsakenness, all those in Christ shall never be forsaken by the Father. Never. Christ suffered God forsaken us for the elect, for those and Christos. We are in Christ eternally. That brief statement, block one, note two, encapsulates the entire theme of Moltmann's superior book, The Crucified God, his second book. And so many people recognize that. I'm not the only one that recognizes that truth. And he's written so many books. I mean, over the years, uh, Jürgen Moltmann has written um, many, many books. And uh, I know I can show you. They're in my library. But uh, The Crucified God, if you're just going to read one manuscript, one of his uh, uh, most important 
most significant manuscripts, then uh, read The Crucified God. That is the one. Now, his international fame began with The Theology of Hope in 1965 in Germany, 1967 in English, and that started his international recognition. But the book that came after that was The Crucified God, and that became even more powerful and he gained even greater international recognition, even with uh, in all the Latin American countries too, that uh, were uh, beginning to uh, posit liberation theology. Moltmann had a huge influence on that movement as well. Now the uh, so I'd go block one, note two for our quick recall here. Block one, note two. Now block two, we should probably, uh, I'm going to go with two here also because it brings up uh, the reign of Christ as Kyrios Lord, life from everlasting life. It began the moment you were justified in Christ. That began the moment you were justified in Christ when you began living as a disciple under the reign of Christ. And Christ is Christos, Messiah, but Christ is also Kyrios, Lord, over all existence, over every tongue. We live within Christ's dominion, and we shall, after this realm of existence, we shall continue to live in the dominion of the living Lord God. So I'm going to go with a block one for a re quick recall. Block one, note two. Block two, note two. All right, block three. Let's see where we go here. Block three. Probably three, I guess. No, we have to go with a... Nope, I take that back. One and two, because we have to really bring up uh, Jürgen Moltmann's personal conviction here. That's the most important thing to take away from block three. And his personal conviction says in three, one, and two that the entirety of our life is resurrected at the hour of death. Okay? That's his conviction. And I'm going to read that again because that is his central conviction here concerning this personal essay. The hour the entirety of our life is resurrected at the hour of death to eternal life. In other words, the last day is when time ends and eternity begins, and that is at the hour of our death. That is what Jürgen Moltmann believes. That is also what I believe, and so I'm thankful. that I probably learned it from him, but I, we agree on that conviction for sure. So that's going to wrap up uh, pages 15 to 27, but uh, uh, in this section of the manuscript, we get into the very personal, deep conviction of Jürgen Moltmann concerning the hour of our death. We'll pick up next time on page 28.